I'm ahead of the curve and today I will review The Myth of Mental Illness by Thomas Zaz. This book is primarily categorised as a psychiatry book and it was written in the 1960s, I believe 1961. Since it's been published it has been heavily scrutinised by its somewhat misleading and provocative title. Now just to make something clear, this book does not claim that mental illness is a myth how you would naturally assume that it's implying, but it instead goes to lengths to provide insight into how Zaz believes that psychiatry and how treatments especially have a political gain to the government, and how psychiatry, like talk therapy for example, is a useless attempt. So a large theme in this book is hysteria, and hysteria was the prehistoric way to label any behaviour that wasn't understood, any kind of alien behaviour. And typically, if anyone had these attributes, such as schizophrenia or depression, they were put into a mental institution. As you may know, in these institutions, they didn't really do much to help them. They instead segregated them and they essentially made them worse. Now since then we've come a long way, We've come a long, long way, but this book highlights, whilst it is outdated to an extent, the, the key ideas, however, whilst the foundation upon what they have built is outdated, but the ideas still stand to be relevant today. So in the introduction, Thomas Zaz says that it is intuitively obvious that there is no such thing as the disease of the mind. And so I, I guess Zaz, in a way, is being a bit semantically picky because he criticises the physician for saying somebody with a brain disease has a mental illness. Instead, Zaz says that a brain disease is something more physical and not mental. Zaz references Semmelweis, Ignaz Semmelweis, and I believe he is the individual who suggested that it was important to wash hands before dealing with patients because it would transmit diseases. But at the time, they rejected Semmelweis' theory, and he was heavily scrutinised for this idea. And this is where Thomas Sass probably says the most profound thing in the entire book. Being wrong can be dangerous, but being right, when society regards the majority's falsehood as truth, could be fatal. Semmelweis' fate, his, his scientific fate of being rejected, actually coined the term Semmelweis reflex. And this basically reflects Semmelweis's fate in the science industry. This term means that a society will reject any new idea if they don't understand it. And so Zaz, I think, is heavily influenced by Semmelweis's outcome of this theory that everybody rejected. And I think this is what Zaz is trying to prove in this book. He's trying to overcome that, that rejection that Semmelweis experienced for himself, and Zaz is trying to get everybody's attention. Hence, I believe, Zaz very intelligently named the book The Myth of Mental Illness. Another interesting point that Zaz makes early on in the book is that not all sick people are patients, and not all patients are sick people. And a heavy theme of this book as well is labelling how dangerous labelling can be in, this, in, the, in the medical industry, or, or in science in general. Because in, as soon as you label an individual as being this or that, you automatically push them into a, a segregation. You force them to act out what they are told they are. And funnily enough, Zaz heavily criticises Freud and Charcot, and the, the, the correlation that these two individuals have in psychiatry, or at least in diagnosis, is that firstly Freud would base his uh, findings on anecdotal results, such as talk therapy, and Charcot, he would diagnose patients with particular diseases, or at least diseases of the mind, and this is something that Thomas Zaz had a big issue with, because again, Charcot would participate in labelling people and then segregating them into a particular practical application, i.e. A, a particular treatment, to assume their, their character and to assume their 
life from this essential guess of what they are through what they act out medically. But obviously at the time this medical interpretation wasn't as accurate as it would be today because at the time they weren't using fMRIs or PET scans. And so yeah, in a way Zaz is definitely picking a bone with quite a few people, um, as I said, particularly Freud and Charcot, because they both, again, based their assumptions from anecdotal evidence. And so, to put it straight, Zaz did not believe psychiatry is a science. He believed it was a pseudoscience. Now, I would say in modern times, psychiatry has many levels, it has many methods, and it's more specific more than holistic, which would be the historical approach. For example, earlier than this book was made, or written, but it would be the natural consensus to cure a headache by uh, slowly pushing an ice pick through a man's eye socket. And now, this would relieve the pain, obviously, but to the extent that the patient would die. So as we can see, historically, we've been more holistic, i.e treating things with a more wholesome approach, such as not treating individuals with their own kind of cure, but instead treating everybody with one cure for all, in a sense. But obviously now we can scan an individual's brain and we can see their individual differences, and so we have a lot more uh, research on the individual brain chemistry and the individual anatomy to provide specific treatments for specific people. But obviously back in the 1960s this just, this just wasn't there, it wasn't available. I believe DNA was only uh, made, made available to the police in the 1980s, or, or maybe the 60s, or late 60s, late 60s or 80s, I can't remember, but, but that, that does show the extent of how scientifically evolved we really were at that point. I suppose another point Zaz is making I've, I've touched upon it earlier, but another point he's making is that through treatments, people can be controlled as such. A population can be maintained through particular methods of treatment in society. And it kind of reminds me of that, that whole saying that a, a patient cured is a, is a customer lost or something. And I think that is true to an extent, but obviously it's circular in its theory. But but nevertheless, it has an element of truth, because as a patient is cured, there is less money, especially where there isn't a welfare system, there is, there is more money uh, being given to the government as a result of the illness of the patient. Now, I think the most interesting idea in this entire book is the subject of coercive treatment. So that's basically the idea that if somebody is suicidal, for example, should the government intervene and should they force this suicidal person to live instead of let them submit their own wishes to die, such as euthanasia. I'm of the personal opinion that euthanasia should be available, but, and, and I think the, the counter-argument to, to what I just said is often overlooked because the counter-argument would suggest, and I'm, not, I'm trying not to straw man here, but the, the counter-argument to my point there would suggest, well, should you just let everybody die who's suicidal? Wouldn't that cause a lot of people to die impulsively? And, and surely a lot of people who just have a downer of a week could just go and have euthanasia? And the answer to that question is, well, no. Because how, euth how euthanasia works is there is a few months worth of therapy, um, forms of talking through the the options and, and trying to see if there's some kind of underlying health issue that is making them think in a particular way that is influencing their actions and, and trying to basically see if how they're thinking is true to themselves and not manipulated by a biological setback. For example, if somebody's got cancer and it's terminal and they and they have no kind of mental issues to say that they are not thinking clearly, if this person is proven not to be thinking clearly then the euthanasia might not necessarily be conducted because they are not in the right state of mind to make that decision. But if this terminal cancer patient is clear of mind and they are consciously making this decision and their family are agreeing with them and they all find that the suffering is too much to bear 
and that death would be a more peaceful and more productive kind of end. The psychiatrist or the people in charge of this euthanasia treatment, they would essentially say, okay, look, fair enough, uh, we've assessed you mentally and physically and it seems like you're in a mental state to make this decision for yourself and we will permit you to go ahead with this option. And so I think I do disagree with Zaz on the fact that coercive treatment should be taken away completely. Because coercive treatment, it is sometimes necessary. I'm kind of on the fence, but I don't agree with Zaz being so objective in his decision making of just saying, no, 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 coercive treatment should be taken out completely. But I think how he was writing this down in the 60s in this book is definitely different to the politics and the regulations of how euthanasia is handled in the modern world. And so I'm not actually sure about his modern view of euthanasia or coercive treatment, but I'm pretty sure he still stands by it. But the only difference I'm trying to make here, the contrast is, is that there's a lot more procedures to actually tell if somebody's being impulsive or not in terms of their desire to go under the procedure of euthanasia. Another point I want to make is that a lot of people at a particular time have felt that they want to do euthanasia or they want to kill themselves and the, the doctors deny this because it would be a crime to kill yourself. And so I have read a lot of people, let's say in Andrew Solomon's The Noonday Demon, which I will review at some point, um, but in Andrew Solomon's book The Noonday Demon, Angel Starkey, she at, at one time, now she was a very damaged individual, and she wanted to kill herself quite often, but through treatment that, yes, it was coercive because they were not letting her kill herself, yes, it was coercive, but through that treatment, she actually regained her conscious will to live and to get through that suffering and she found enough meaning to justify her suffering. And so the point I'm making here is that sometimes coercive treatment is necessary to allow somebody to really see that sometimes somebody has to endure coercive treatment to really reflect upon what they really want and if they really do want to die. Because Angel Starkey, it's not, at one point, she she didn't really see the meaning of living and she endured enough pain to say that, that she wanted to die. But she came to a point in care and, and being looked after that she actually had a reason to live. And so if the doctors just let her kill herself, she would never have experienced that rejuvenization of actually realising that she does want to live. So I think coercive treatment in this sense is, is necessary, but I must say it doesn't work for everybody. And that's the main point here. Coercive treatment doesn't work for everybody, but for those who it does work for, their lives are saved. And, and, and there is an unlimited, infinite amount of good that comes out of those lives being revived. So I think I'll leave it there. Um, there are a lot of deep ideas in this book. It, it does read like a scientific paper, and Zaz is a scientific writer, and so it might not be as immersive as uh, somebody might want it to be. But if you're looking for really interesting philosophical dialogue and scientific dialogue and also historical dialogue on psychiatry, this is really an important book. Like if, if you are into psychology or philosophy, euthanasia, the idea of death, therapy, this is a really essential read. Thomas Zaz really did change thought on euthanasia and coercive treatment. And so this is an essential read if you enjoy psychology. Anyway, I've got my Goodreads linked in the bio, my website linked in the bio, and my Instagram. Um, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.